So what this class is about, writing sonnets, it's about what I finally was blessed enough to discover was my experience of the sonnet when I was properly taught, which is that instead of it being a bunch of rules, it's actually a motion. It's a wave. It's a, it's a function. It has its own flow. And when you can identify the right amount of material for a sonnet and material that fits properly in a sonnet, and when you've worked your way through some of the motions of the sonnet enough times that they become part of your body, part of your flow, part of your rhythm, eventually you can write a sonnet. Not the kind you wrote when you were, you know, 10, 11, 12, but the kind that actually feel very much like writing a poem. For me, if I only could write single sonnets, I basically wouldn't bother. The reason I love the heck out of a sonnet is the sonnet sequence. It is, it's like, it's like the strobe light of story. It has been a proven tool for many writers in times of writer's block, in times of trouble, in times when they had more to say than they knew how to say it. There is something about the sonnet which actually has the potential to heal. It's more than just an awfully nice shape. You know, we're talking about a verse form that began in the 13th century, in the 1200s, and that has in fact been revived into itself, into something that looks very much like itself in multiple different countries. There are not a lot of verse forms that have in fact been exported into so many different cultures and languages and picked up and owned with their own rituals and rhythms in each one. This is a, this is a truly, truly carpet baggy kind of an experience as a poem. It, it's, it's a very effective poem. I think for each sonnet, not whether it's getting the Betty Crocker Award for sonnet recipes, but whether, what, what is it, where is the delight located? What object does it most resemble? Is it a recipe? Is it a tombstone? Is it a portrait? Is it a photograph? Is it a scene? Is it a philosophical argument? Is it um, a piece of gossip? Is it a newspaper clipping, what is this object, what aesthetic objects does it most remind you of? How long should a sonnet be? 14 lines. 14 lines, yay, great, more or less, exactly. Plus or minus a few. What meter should a sonnet have? I, you can just shout it out, we love the sound. Iambic pentameter. In different countries, there were different meters that went with the sonnet. Hendecasyllabics, Alexandrines, it depends on what country you're in, what the meter's going to be. Every rhyme ties a knot. That's how a rhyme functions in a piece of formal verse. It stitches things together. It gives you a feeling of seams, of seams of stitching. Sometimes that's visual. You don't feel it in your body, it doesn't yank your gut, but you can see with your eye that elements are repeating, and that patterning gives us a pleasure. I mean, so much of poetry is pattern pleasure. And rhyme is one form of pattern pleasure. Undesirable rhymes. <laughs> and I want you to know that every last one of these undesirable rhymes would be fabulous to use in your sonnets. I highly recommend them. If you, okay, if you want to rhyme, for instance, blackness and dances, you go for it. That sounds really good to me. What about willow and shallow? Isn't that nice? <laughs> Hill and waterfall. You've got the double L's at the end. Nothing wrong with that. How about turning and scorning? Great rhymes. In a sonnet sequence, I don't have to handle the stage business. I go from scene to scene to scene to scene. The structure is holding the whole thing together. And in the end, people say, you're such a good sonnet writer or something like that. And really, I've just saved myself so much trouble. I'm not good. I'm naughty. So we should look at the sequence and see what it does and how those empty spaces are actually like, like camera cuts. That's what they are. The camera's one place, then it, the camera's another place, and you go right to the nuggets. You don't have to do all the other work.